Welcome back to the Offside Podcast. And as requested by people in the comment section, we've got a, a camera for us so you can see. Ali's happy about that, so he's not <laughs> the only person. <laughs> um, I'm Danny, he, him. We got Tama, <laughs> he, him. We got Junior, he, him. Ali? Just, just Ali Otta, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Tama put me up to it, so I was like, hey, we're doing pronouns now. Shit, colonial uh, pronouns, is it? <laughs> hey, hey, there's a lot of other languages out there. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> how, was, <laughs> how was everyone? Good, good. Good, good, good. Uh, we're jumping straight into a um, pretty interesting topic. And I initially thought this was about the um, Rugby Hall of Fame, but no, it's directly aimed at the New Zealand Rugby uh, Union. Um, and it's from uh, a Tongan man, Bakilau Manasi Lua, who was a part of the Pacific Board. Um, I'm just going to read the comment so we can kind of respond to it. There's a whole bunch of media surrounding it all across NZ Herald, RNZ, uh, the news as well. And so Manasi on his Facebook about five days ago says, New Zealand rugby can go get fucked. Angry emoji, angry emoji, angry emoji. I'm sick of being nice. You know full well how our Pacifica people have literally bled for the game, yet you ignore our constant cause for equity, treat us like mindless monkeys, ignore the Pacific rugby strategy you endorsed and launched just last year, all we asked for was one seat at the decision-making table, uh, the decision-making board table. We make up nearly 40% of the All Blacks and Sevens at least. We are overrepresented at top-level rugby and grassroots rugby in every role except board and management, but especially volunteering to build the game. Pacifica absolutely, in caps, deserve respect and mana from NZR. So I quit NZR PAG, effective immediately, and out of respect, let them know last night. I love my fellow members, Cheers of Pag, Pauline Jean uh, Lighton, I believe, and Taonu'u and all our players and former greats and legends of the game, like my Usos, Savia Tama, Eroni Clark, and Laoli Sir Michael Jones. But I can be but I can't be silent and a bystander as they walk all over us again. Uh, and that is a message from Manasi and his words have gone viral. He's had uh, meetings, well, he's had interviews with uh, Radio New Zealand, 531 PI, and he's kind of all over social media, especially in the Pacific space. Thoughts, team? Yep, so um, the term that they used a lot in the Pacific strategy is equitable representation. So obviously, as stated, the Pacific rugby players are like 40% of Super Rugby and 40% of the All Blacks. But on the board, it's zero percent. There's no Pacific Island representation there, and um, <clears throat> and then a lot of things like refereeing. There's, I think it's three percent um, employees for the New Zealand Rugby Union is only seven percent. Uh, coaching is only like ten percent. So um, the Pacific strategy made a big move in involving Pacific, uh, having Pacific involvement not just on the field but off the field. And that's what he's um, talking about. But I think, like, first of all, like, it's the New Zealand Rugby Union. You know, it's not the Samoan Rugby Union. It's not the Tongan Rugby Union. The New Zealand Rugby Union, to me, it's not surprising, like, they're being the New Zealand Rugby Union. Like, this is nothing new. They've always um, centered, I don't want to say colonizers, but they've always centered their own in interests. So, you know, the... Involvement of Pacifica people on the board will uh, be like an afterthought. And now, right now, you know, with the woke stuff, it'd probably be seen as a bit more tokenism. But um, they're not being unreasonable. They're being what New Zealand always is, and it's putting New Zealand interests first and New Zealand being like white majority. So I don't see them being unreasonable. But that's not to tell him that, you know, put up and shut up. I think it's, I think it's great. This, this picture that we're seeing that New Zealand Rugby Union being like the colonial stronghold and being under attack by, by him and his words, I think that's a great image. That's, that's how you will get somebody in there is by speaking up, speaking loud. Um, and he said, he said in his interview that I have to say some swear words you know, to get everyone's attention. Yeah, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that because I've, I've had to do the same. And you, know, you start off 
being nice and that and nothing changes, eventually that song changes and you've got to start swearing, you've got to start being a bit more angry. And he's got the attention now. Um, he said a lot of other things like, um, we are just performing monkeys for colonial institutions. He's part of the Pacific Advisory Group. And he said that that committee is just a toothless committee, just a PR stunt. And New Zealand Rugby Union don't listen to anything they say. It's pointless. And um, it's, I like how he said his stuff and just came out soon. It's, uh, well, there's a couple of things to address um, within that. And it's, I, I think from the very top, though, um, the whole representation on the board. And I, like, I think you're right, like it's New Zealand. Like New Zealand can do what New Zealand wants. But when you have a majority, a culture that's, that's immigrated here, that's out on the front lines, um, and I'm not just talking about sports, I'm talking about entertainment, my world as well, and, and we're there on the front lines, but there's no one behind us to help service our community. I think, like, I, I love that he framed it that way. Um, yeah, he, he said he, they sent a, a letter late last year about the New Zealand Rugby Union sticking to the Pacific strategy. And in it included not just contribution to rugby, but also in society, in the economy. Like uh, he mentioned, uh, the, the Pacific economy is worth about $10 billion for New Zealand. So, yeah, you're right. Like um, Rugby? No, economy. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, so... Um, I understand New Zealand Rugby Union, they are, they are, they've always been this colonial stronghold. But it's not unreasonable what he's asking for, especially in this climate, with the massive representation, like you said, of Pacific uh, players. What he is asking for is completely reasonable. It's fair. Um, and I was going through the Pacific strategy last night, and man, it's just like saturated in Pacific shit. Like, you got really? Pacific, yeah, you got like Pacific decorations everywhere on every page. <laughs> Nami, you know, nami. Yeah, yeah, nami. That's that's what it, it's just the wokest bloody article that I've read in a while, and just like every page has got patterns, and the strategy is like, oh, they got these specific terms like um, step one, we have to prepare the soil, get it, get it, you know, and they use all these words, and so you got this paragraph in Pacific culture, we got to prepare the soil when we're starting, and then like the rugby, what we're actually going to do in rugby is like this paragraph, yeah, okay, and then the next step. You know, it's, um, we must plant the seed. And they got the Pacific word for that. And it's just like, it's so much Pacific. Shit. Who's reading this shit? Like, it, who was oh, this for? I was reading it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but who was this Exactly. For? And it's lengthy. It's really long. And it's a lot of talking shit. Like, there's yeah. a lot of talk. And it's saturated in all these Pacific niceties. It's got a, a message from the chairman of the New Zealand Rugby Board, uh, Patsy Reddy, mm. and Balangi girl. And she's like... Um, uh, kia ora, telefalava, <laughs> nasi bulavanak, and her intro <laughs> in Pacific words is massive. And the first paragraph is like, um, our aim is for equitable representation um, in rugby playing roles and non-rugby playing roles. And the next paragraph is, we understand that we are not doing that. <laughs> like, like so they, they know. They admit, yeah, they admit that they're nowhere near, but they don't do shit about it. Yeah. And then the next paragraph is like, so we are going to strive for equitable representation and also support uh, clubs around New Zealand to embrace Pacific representation. And so they know exactly what the issue is, and they don't do shit. So the board is what, uh, there's no Pacific people on it, there's an Indian on it, and uh, two, two Māori people, and no Pacific person. And it's just like, fuck. They know what's wrong. They know why... He's angry. Yeah. And like he said, they don't give a shit. They don't give a shit. They just want the performing players. I don't want to use my it's it's the um it's the tick the box thing, eh? Like let's just we've got money. Well, well, for well they haven't even ticked the box. That's the thing. There's no Pacific board member there. Right. And I think around New Zealand it's only like three percent of all the boards. You know, if you put all the boards together in all of the provinces, only three percent are Pacific. So it's just like everywhere, man. It's a, it's a big issue where there's no equitable representation, even though they keep saying we're going uh, to have equitable representation in roles off the field, refereeing, coaching, 
administration and governance, meaning... Refereeing is a big one too. Like okay. when yeah, you refereeing. said refereeing, I was like, that popped in my head. I was like, yeah, we don't actually have... Like we could have used them in the last World Cup. Yeah. Fiji could have used them. And that's the power. That's the power position, refereeing. Yeah. You can determine the games. And there's, you can match fix, and they've been match fixing for years. And they deliberately, they don't want anyone in that position because obviously, you know, you're going to lose the ability to fix a match or you're going to lose that ability to, to ref and control. But, um, yeah, I, everything he says is on point. There's, there's an issue there, but nothing is being done. It's all like just a woke, woke talking shit, diversity and all of this. Yes, Nga Mihi will do all that and nothing's done. Nothing's being done, and I think he feels that, you know, maybe if I swear, fuck you this, fuck you that, um, maybe some attention will... He's got the attention. Oh, he's definitely got the attention. Yeah. And the substance is behind it as well. If you go through the Pacifica strategy that he's talking about, the assessment report uh, last year that came out at the end of last year, yeah, there's a lot of talk in there, and nothing's done. It's, um, it brings up kind of an important um, conversation around boards representation all that nice shit that they like to tick the box on where we're never at and um like i can liken this to my career in the arts and film and tv uh nz on air film commission a lot of these places nz to me that I've, I've worked at and i've always asked like who's on the board who's making these decisions for our communities and it's almost like they will hide or they will have someone on the board but they'll never mention their name and it's an islander of their choosing <laughs> and that person probably grew up in freaking Howick or North Shore or whatever, and they've never done a fire love love or a CE or anything, so they've never really. And you've talked about this before that lived experience. They always kind of choose someone that's like, oh no, they will wear a suit and tie for us, yeah. performing M word, um, which is uh, yeah, yeah, sad. Yeah, but even like dudes who do know their fire samba will, will also yeah, can true. be can be easily led and but you know they're not gonna take anyone on the board who's revolutionary who's gonna um, upset the system but I don't feel like he's looking for that anyway I don't feel like he wants a massive overall overhaul I think he's um, just some representation he's just after some form of representation at the top and they are the top but <laughs> what is wrong with that though like I, I, it, to me it sounds like a parting shot like he, he's, he's on the out so he's like fuck them but what is wrong if your game is 40 percent can't we just have one person oh yeah please it, it, especially when that person will not come anywhere close to a majority yeah you know so if they add in one now it'll be one out of ten that's ten percent voting power mm. you know so it's not gonna it's not gonna they're not gonna lose any power at all you know, they're, they're very calculated. Perhaps it might feel, oh, if we let in this one, the floodgates are going to open. Yeah. You know, if, if we give in to his style of talking, then the next people are going to talk like that. Fuck the New Zealand Rugby Union, fuck that. You know, and the, the whole mana of the New Zealand Rugby Union will go down if we give in to that. Yeah. So perhaps it's that, you know, just not making, not giving one metre, you know, one inch to, to Pacific. One, one inch of their power because, you know... Because they're afraid? Yeah, maybe because they're afraid, but I just feel like they don't give a fuck anyway, man. They're just looking at this shit like... Because they've always been that way. Like, New Zealand Rugby Union have always looked after themselves. And I remember when Fiji played New Zealand Māori twice, one in New Zealand and one in Fiji. Mm. Fiji had to pay $250,000 match fee for that to have the Māori over there. Just right? the Māori team. Yeah, and that's not a normal agreement. Usually you go over... They keep the gate and all of that. But they, New Zealand Rugby Union organised, so uh, negotiated, so the Fiji Rugby Union had to pay 250000 for the New Zealand Māori team to go. The Fiji Rugby Union CEO came out, bro, they nearly bankrupt us, you know, cool. like to pay that fee. So that's just an example of New Zealand Rugby Union not giving a fuck about Pacific. They don't care, man. They're after the bottom dollar for New Zealand. And, and Fiji, closest, you know, all of this history and all of this... You know, we're, we're woke Pacific people. At the end of the day, they don't give a fuck. And they'll use the Māori to do it. Like, that was a New Zealand Māori team. Yeah. You know, so at the end of the day, New Zealand Rugby Union will look after number one. And any Pacific person who wants to be involved in that, you have to be part of Conform. that. And support that 
New Zealand is number one. And to me, that's not unreasonable. And it just emphasizes the importance of our own unions. I think mm. what some of rugby union were probably hoping for, and maybe, no, what definitely them was like, oh, yes, there's a bit less pressure on us now. Yeah. You know, because the Pacifica has started up, um, Pacifica strategy, Moana Pacifica started up, you know, maybe more eyes on them and we can still keep on doing our dealings. But at the end of the day, sovereignty over our rugby shit is the Samoan Rugby Union. Yeah. That has to be the most important, Fiji Rugby Union, Tongan Rugby Union, because there, will, they will always, they should always be for Samoa, for Fiji, for Tonga. New Zealand will always be for New Zealand, and as so long as we're 8% of the population, we are the minority population, minority economically, it's, it'll, it'll be unfair to yeah. divert all your attention to that. Mm. Common sense to me is like, if you just invest in us, and even at a very minimal level, we've been doing so much for you anyway. Right. If you just give a bit more power to us, we can help you. Because we, we talked about stats of rugby dying in this country. And they're targeting Pacific people. They're, they're targeting Pacific people. And it's funny you say that because in the Pacific strategy on page 13, so page 12 they say, what is our goal of this Pacific strategy? And the goal is we want increased participation of Pacific people in rugby playing roles and non-rugby playing roles. And then page 13 says, why? Why is this our goal to involve lots of Pacific people? The very first sentence says, participation in rugby is on the decline. Okay? Participation in rugby is decreasing, is going down. So we need more Pacific people involved. Yeah. You know, so it's like, okay, we're in the shit. Our, our game is dying. We need to target some people who are going to keep our game alive. Maybe save rugby. Okay? Or save their power. Because what's the point of being powerful when you've got no one playing the sport? <laughs> you know what I mean? So to keep their position up there, they need some people to be involved in the sport. And so they're targeting Pacific people. And I say is that you can go look at it. You can go download the Pacific Strategy, page 13. Why? It says, why is this our goal? Why is participation of, increased participation of Pacific people our goal? Because participation is on the decline. Okay, there's less people playing rugby, and we need Pacific people to save it. Otherwise, we're powerful for nothing. Which is all the more reason why you should have more of us on the board. Yeah, exactly. Um, and even just like, we, like, we're not trying to match the 40%, you know, the 40% players. Something is always better than nothing, but at the moment, it's nothing. Um, I wanted to talk about my nice, I guess, presentation of this, because <laughs> uh, I don't know him personally. Um, but I can uh, see where he's coming from because I've, I've been in a similar situation, especially in an industry that um, puts all our... So I'm, I'm talking specifically about uh, radio, and so they all front hip-hop and R&B stations with Pacific people, but in the back, yeah. in the boardrooms, making all the decisions for what we do. Yeah. It's not our people. And so there's a massive disconnect on, on how you market us to us and even if our market audience isn't us, you're still using us, um, which could kind of go against how we are culturally. And so he started off by saying he's been nice. Uh, there was an interview of 531 P PI where Manasi said he's been quiet, nice, like most Pacific, well, like all of us are when we enter a corporate industry, right, or business. Um, and he's tried to talk to them in this tone, but that seems not to get through. And it always kind of gets us to this point where we're either violent or crazy um or even prior to that where we're being direct and firm and i feel like he's being direct and firm and he's still not being heard and then now he has to just call them out on their bullshit um and i hate i hate this because it makes him look like he's crazy he's not because i've been here before you've been here before yeah, where we've had to use words that will get their attention when we've used words before that are talking to them in their language, which is nice, which is polite, which is by the law, and yet we're still not being heard. But now he's being heard. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts around how do we communicate to these people where we don't have to go to this extreme where it's to kind of put us against our own people in some regards? Because he's even got Ronnie Clark. Like, he talked about on 531 uh, PI where he was um, at Polyfest just a couple of days ago, and he met, off, met up with Ronnie, and Ronnie asked him, take it down he's like nah i need to be heard yeah. like how do we get to this point where we t like we be heard without 
going to these extremes well you know these extremes in their eyes i don't think you can man like like um I understand him completely. Like he, he said that they sent a letter at the end of last year. So he's done the, the proper process. They've done the proper process. You know, and they're probably sending emails to each other, you know, talking about this all the time. Probably more than that letter. And like they've done the they've done the right ways. You know, all of the the proper ways or the proper ways. And Bro, they just don't give a shit. So eventually that song changes, man. You know, you're, you're, you're being nice the whole time. You're being respectful the whole time. And they're literally still saying, shut the fuck up, we don't care. Okay? And they, they hadn't replied. They hadn't involved the uh, Pacifica Advisory Group in anything, despite the letters addressing these issues. Okay? So they were completely ignored. Okay? That's why he came out and said what he had to say. Like, it is stupid to keep on going the same avenue when you keep on getting denied. It's, it's really stupid. You have to change your, your plan of attack if you're genuine. And unfortunately, when you change that style, then you get labeled, like you said, crazy, emotional, and people lose sight of the substance of what he's saying. So it's very important for everybody. Like, There's a lot of substance in what he's saying. But he has had to come out and say, the things that he said because he's been proper he has been respectful all this time for years for like three years this group has been doing it the right way and no one listens and it is insane to continue to do what you know is not working so he's had to change tact we all got to focus on the substance of what he's saying and don't be led by these words oh he's emotional passion is emotion love is emotion and you use, we always use our passion and our love for our people to ignite the logic and the other side to, so we can go deeper into issues. So there's nothing wrong with being passionate. There's, there's nothing wrong with loving your people. Those emotions is what drives us, drives us deeper into these issues, to look into places. Man, I was up last night reading the fucking strategy, uh, Pacifica strategy document and the assessment report. Out of passion and love, those emotions drove me to find out the substance of what he's talking about, and he has a, he, he's he's on he's on it, bro. He's he's on the right path. He's everything substantively, is is where we should be, and we should be attacking these colonial institutions and not be so um, distracted by. Oh, he said the f word. Like it should be. Why is he saying the f word? Oh, he said it this way. Why is he saying it that way? Okay, and once you get through that, you realize, okay, I, I understand why he's saying the F word. I can put that to the side, and I can see the substance of his argument. And I think it was wrong for Erroni Clark to tell him to take it down. You know, I think good leaders, you speak your piece. You know, we're all intelligent enough to know that that's his piece, not Erroni's piece. Yeah. Okay, we're all, we're all smart enough. We're not going to associate Erroni Clark, Michael Jones, with with what he is saying. It's okay. Okay, and so it was wrong for Ronnie Clark to suggest that to him. I think, bro brother, you speak your mind, you speak your experience. Um, I think he should be encouraged, and more people should be encouraged. Remember, like, English as well is not a lot of our languages. A lot of our people, English is second language. A lot of our people don't have the, um, the diction and the vocabulary and all of that shit. Oh, you said the wrong word. You should have said this word. It's like, fuck. You say whatever you want to say, and we are smart enough to, to see past you know, the swear words and that and see the issues. And if you look at his issues, if you look at the substance of what he's saying, it's on point. He's absolutely right. You look at the stats, you, you look at what they, um, the New Zealand Rugby Union have said about their equitable representation, he's right. They're all shit. They've been talking shit. There is no representation at all, let alone equitable. There's nothing. Okay, so they, they even got to representation, yet they're fucking chucking in the woke word, equitable representation. He's absolutely right. So look beyond swear words and all that shit, because we have been programmed to accept only if you talk the white Balangi colonial way, then we will accept you. And we, so we, oh, anything else outside of that? Oh, no, nah, he's emotional. Oh, oh he's crazy. One of my um my favorite words, and I've been using this like so when I <laughs> funny story because when I when I got a job at um Flavor Radio Station, and so the the position that I had there was a um 
a digital content producer. So I looked after all the social media. Um, and because I've been doing it for a long time, I understand audience online. I understand media. I understand how to communicate those two based on like everything that I've done. And um, I helped grow that channel. Uh, but I was told not to lean lean into the Pacific community. I was told not to do that. But the people that were driving our socials were Pacific people. And so radio stations like that, they will target specific areas in Auckland that they want to make money from. So on the radio side, they targeted North Shore. I get it. You know, mid to upper class. You know what I mean? I get it. But the people online are not people from North Shore. It's all people from South Auckland, West Auckland, Central they were the ones, and I could see the stats analytically, so I proved to them, like, yo, like, um, it's working. Let us get the digital out there. Um, but one of the words, because I always had a dispute with um, my boss at the time, but the one word that I used, and it, and it shook him up a couple of times, was I disagree. Mm -hmm. So anytime he would, he would bring forward a, a case in point, I'd show him analytics, and I'd be like, I disagree. And and just the way that he perked up, and was like, uh, because it's, it's that whole thing of, like, once we kind of take power back into our hands based on experience, based on whatever way that the contract frames it, and then we bring our point to the front. The other side always seems to get, uh, yeah, it's yeah, an intelligent islander, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> and you're in, you're in the media, bro. The media have, uh, they got power. They got power to mobilize youth, you know, and to influence young minds, and so do these rugby players. Yeah. You know, and, and once they're given that, once they're empowered with that, you know, once, if you keep directing it to Pacific um, um, listeners, you know, and start changing the messaging a bit and, you know, maybe empowering them. So that's why they're very careful. Mm. They're very careful with who's in particular positions, what you say in those particular positions. Because, yes, everything's a threat, especially with the talented, unbelievably brilliant Pacific people. Yeah. Like, once we dial into that, need to start dialing into our brilliance so they can't hold it back so that's why like every everything to them feels like a threat mm. because of the way they've gained their power you know the, the cunningness and but and all that theft and all that bullshit so you'll be out there just trying to be nice and they think you're dodgy yeah because they acquired their power through dodginess <laughs> Just in uh, finality of this, uh, Manasseh has obviously quit the union. Um, That's one thing he shouldn't have done. True. I think make them fucking uncomfortable. Make them like, oh, they're, they're probably legal ramifications, but it would have been nice for him just to sit there and what? What are you going to do? Yeah. Because we're going to fire you because you wanted uh, fairness? You know, I reckon he would have just, I don't think they would have fired him. Because of the look, it would have looked really stupid. This guy is asking for complete fairness, completely reasonable what he's saying. Just one, you know, one ten percent, while 40 percent are out there getting their body smashed, earning the billions that New Zealand Rugby Union have, okay, these Pacific men and women getting smashed, earning the billions, and we just want one representative there. Now, had they fired him, that would have been a fucked up look for the New Zealand Rugby Union. True. He actually did them a favour by quitting. Which, you know, sometimes I sort of think of something like this and go, that's why I'm like this at the moment. Like, is this for real? <laughs> you know, because the gangster thing would have been to stay there and go, what? What are you going to do now? You know? You, I didn't quit. I fucking went, World Rugby, what are you going to do? Get banned. I was like, okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but Damn, I should have stayed then. <laughs> bro, stay. And, and, like, and at least like he got his words out. Yeah. You know, so that's the key. Get your fucking, use your media to spread the whole issue, yeah. and it clearly looks unfair, and then just, just sit there, and let's see what they do. That's what he should have done. He should have called them on it. Yeah. And then had they done something, then you know for sure they're, they're pieces of shit. But he did them a favor by quitting. And yeah. They're just going to replace him with another? Well, that's it. It's like he wasn't even there. Like... Like, you want to see where they stand, you know? Put them on the spot. What are you going to do when someone complains about your unfairness? Okay, are you going to sack him because that'll look shit? Or are you going to keep him? And you're going to have to put up with him now. And then he's going to think, fuck, see, this is where words work. You see, I yeah, can talk yeah, like yeah, this yeah, all yeah, the yeah. time. 
he had them in a good spot and he let them go. Well, we don't know um, what else is happening on that side or in those kind of conversations. But, yeah, just from what he's saying, he's out. Um, he's left on. I guess he's left on his terms, so it seems. Um, I don't know what the ramifications are now for that. Um, apart from, like, it's just going to happen again. It's just going to be the same song and dance that we get from these big money-making machines. That, But what he did is, is the way to do it. You know, if you're gonna go out, fucking go out like this, fucking shit. Yeah! Fuck you, fuck you! Tony Matana styles. It's the only way to go out, man. You're never gonna go out. You know what? This sucks. I'm not telling anyone. This sucks. I quit. <laughs> you know, you have to go use the media, bring it all out. It's clearly he's right. Clearly not fair. There's no equitable representation. He's right. At least he took some shots. I live flavor. I took my shots internally. Mm. But um, we've got a podcast that's bigger than all their podcasts, so um, we're good. That's the one. That's the one. Believe that's in ourselves. That's the other way to do it. That's, that's the, the other one. way to Believe do in it. ourselves, and we just keep fighting. Keep fucking throwing them fingers up. Keep shooting. Shoot a shoot. Always keep shooting. Be brave. Keep shooting. Love that. Um, yeah. Just in, in conclusion, uh, shout out to Manasi. I hope uh, his his next venture is all good. And and yeah. I don't know what to say about the New Zealand Rugby Union. I don't know what to say about any of these boards that have a majority of Pacific people working with them, working for them, but then none in the, in the back helping out. It's just, it just for me, it's common sense that you would have some of ours represent. Um, it just means you'll have better product. But don't wait for them. Like, you know, colonizers, they, they, they won't change. You, you can't wait for the oppressor to change their conscience. You, you have to force it. You've got to force the hand. Mm. So good on him for taking shots. You always have to force the hand. Don't wait for shit. Force the hand. Force the hand. <laughs> <laughs> Psh, goodbye. I quit. <laughs> but force the hand. Like, push them. You know, make them uncomfortable. Smash them. But don't wait. Don't wait. Nothing will change if you wait. Yeah. Uh, we're going to move into some, some comments from our TikTok and facebook and just some comments around um some of the videos that we've posted online uh over the past two weeks um let's start off with pablo carbino um sionu loaki jonah lomu jerry collins gone way too soon r.i.p or the usos peace um uh you've played off sione uh you know jerry um and I don't believe you've met Jonah, but um, a lot of young our young players, man. A lot of our young Pacific yes. men. And there was Curtis Hayu. Do you remember him? Yes, I remember There's Curtis. another one. Yeah, yep. Blues, eh? you know, So I think there's a big lesson there for our Pacific people. Like, what are Pacific players? Watch everything. Be careful, man. There's a lot of... Um, there's, a, there's not just the contacts in sports. There's all these little pills now. Caffeine shots. Um, what do you call it? The uh, powders and stuff. Mm. There's so much shit that hasn't been. We don't know the long long term effects. They've only come in like recently. All the powders and all the creatine and all of the protein shakes and all of that. And then you combine it with the caffeine shots, and you combine it with the head collisions. You know, just really look after your body. Remember, you can't go wrong with nature, with um, natural things. If you can, I understand that some people don't have naturally big bodies. But Pacific people do, we, you know, we're thick boned, uh, we put on muscle. I, I actually went through my career only doing one gym a month. So I, for some reason, I just look at weights and I'll just get big. So I'm very lucky genetically, but um, I didn't take any protein shakes. I didn't take any protein powder in my whole career. So um, watch out for their studies about power aid as well. Okay, that's not good for you. So just be careful with all the uh, products. You know, you, we don't know the long-term effects. You're having it every day. And there's so many young, young men who are young players who are having problems after rugby. And obviously, um, a lot of great, great people who have died early, died young. So really look after yourselves. Um, find the balance. There's stuff that's, I guess, and I don't, I don't know the family, but um, it, it felt like Jonah's condition was hereditary. Um, and then there's stuff that, like, it's even deeper than sports, eh? Like, some of the things that, like, some of the foods yeah. or the things that have been introduced to the islands haven't. Yeah, eh? exactly. Like, uh, 
Man, I, I don't know. There's so many conspiracy theories about that 90, 95 game. Remember how the whole team got South sick? South Africa, yeah. You know, so we're getting into big money. Okay? We're getting into, you know, I don't want to be too into conspiracies, but, like, you got to watch out poisons, sexually transmitted diseases. Yeah. Okay, so it's um, getting, um, what do you call it? Putting the pills in your drinks while you're not looking. Yeah, you, spiked. Spiked, you know, spiked drinks and... Um, sexually, a lot of dudes are going for Viagra and those ones. Like, what is the long-term effect on that if you're having it after every game and shit, you know? Or throughout the whole week. <laughs> but, like, all of that shit, like, you're having so many foreign chemicals in that into your body along with the chemicals that are going into just normal foods these days. There's so much to be careful for. Um, just, yeah, I, I don't know how specifically everyone died, but just yeah. really look into your body and being careful, and it's better to be conservative. You know? Rest in peace to great all those place. young men, great. all those great young men. Uh, Wayne Fa'alongo uh, has said on TikTok, that South Africa game in the World Cup was edge of your seat viewing, one of my fave games to watch. And another comment said here by Esera Brown, we didn't come close to SA. We were robbed. <laughs> you played in this game, and this was uh, one of the highlights of the tournament for a lot of people, not just Samoans. It was a freaking game. Yeah, the fact people still bring it up, <laughs> to me it feels like so long ago. It was so long ago. Mm. Yeah, bro, we were robbed, man. It's fucking... Nigel Owens then went on in an interview like two weeks after. We did so well. I was so proud of Wales. You know, we, we did really well supporting the boys all the way. What the fuck? Like, he refereed a game that affected whether or not Wales progress. Mm. And he's fucking come out saying, oh, God, bro, we were robbed. Like, South Africa had to make, like, 160 tackles. We only made, like, 40. We were, we were on attack that whole game, that whole second half. Didn't get one penalty in their half. And we were kept perfectly outside the seven-point bonus, bonus point. Eight points, so... You know one thing I learned about that game, and this is a bit vain, but I'm gonna fucking say it. I don't get one close up in that game. And so, <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. I was so, trying to find footage of you in bro, that game, but it's yeah. hard to find. Unbelievable. But eh? everyone that watched that game knows. Yeah, but that's crazy, right? Like, so they they got they the fucking you, memo. <laughs> they got a memo. I never knew you could do that. Is like, don't get a close up on Eliotta. You know, you watch any game. You make a line break. When play stops, you get a close up. And you get a replay, replay. of it. Slow-mo. Yeah, slow-mo. I made shitloads of line breaks, big hits, not a single close-up. There's about probably like 30 cameras. Yeah, bro. Not a <laughs> single close-up. And so the, the, the memo was clearly, because I'd started shit before that game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that's why like, people remember it, because I was talking my shit before the and game. And you backed it up. And then I have to go back it up. Yeah. And I was fucking cheap. I was, I was working on my man of the match speech during that game. In the last 10 minutes, I was like, okay, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this. That's how fucking eat ass I was. I was like, bro, I fucked this shit up, man. <laughs> uh, so I was working on my man of the mess speech, and I was going to call out the All Blacks, because I was like, yeah, we beat Australia this year. Fuck over South Africa. And in the speech, I was going to say, we want you. We want the All Blacks. Fuck this tournament. Full on wrestling promo. Yeah, yeah, hard <laughs> up. Fuck this tournament. I want the All Blacks. And then uh, Burger. Burger's got man of the match. I was like, oh, shit. Fuck, I just finished smoking that dude. Man, what a uh, game! What was the um? What was the like the talk? Because it was the must-win match, right? Yeah. So what was the talk in 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 that um that shed before you guys got out? Like, what was that? It like? was hard because our, our our boys had three days rest, and in Test match rugby, bro, that's not enough. Dudes mm. are still sore, so the talk was low, man. Dudes were getting rested. That's why I could stay up the two nights and video video South Africa all their Test matches, because I had only played a bit of the the game before against Fiji, whereas like Lala, Mahonri, um, Murray, Fasavalu, like they had played every game and they were all iced up, they were all resting, bed early, and so me, me and um, David Lemmy were fresh and that's why we like played well, like we were fresh and I remember seeing the South African team in the paper have gone fishing, they had their, you know, because they had eight days rest, so they were enjoying New Zealand sights and sounds and we were like, Fuck this Bro, shit, man. Like, honestly, because every every other top tier like Wales were yeah. 
jumping off the dock yes. in the viaduct yeah. in, in Ireland where in Northland somewhere right out. and then Samo Fiji Tonga are like I stopped yeah I stopped <laughs> and these games are intense man so you throw everything at it for your people I remember like eight days after I had an interview with John Campbell and with TV1 and I was sore man eight days after and I told them bro I'm still sore now like fuck to, to, for these guys to play like four games in like a week and a half and like big test matches against South Africa after three days. That was the biggest match fixing bullshit, man. I learned a lot. I learned about match fixing. I learned about how they can edit videos. I learned about the judiciary process. Fuck, man. What a team, though. Anyway. <laughs> were, were you guys, so game finishes, obviously not the result. Someone's like, we're super proud of you guys, though. But what was it like in the dress? Like, were you guys filthy? No, to be honest, I could see dudes were exhausted. You guys like, were just hurt. Yeah, I, I could see, yeah, emotionally hurt. Like, we were, we were so close. But even like, so the thing, that, the biggest thing about test, test match rugby is emotion. Mm. Fucking dudes crying, right? And the problem with playing is you release it all. And then you need that week to like build up emotionally to get into that, fuck, the nerves again. You know what? It's like you're a boxer, but you're competing every week. Oh yeah, bro. And it, rather than months. Yeah, bro. And it just all, all the it's just not there. And I was nervous, and they believe me. We we were fucking we were ginky, bro. We were ready to go. But I could see dudes before the match. Like, well, Henry did his best. He did this amazing speech where half the team started crying. He was like, um, you know, tomorrow. Uh, this was the captain's speech the night before. Tomorrow, our people will be waving their flag. You fucking give them a reason to wave it forever. Bro, dudes are like, fuck. And I fuck, remember, is that his exact bro, words? I remember going, oh, bars, bro, fuck. And man, and you just see everyone lift. Like, everyone was struggling to, to get up for that game. And I understand, man. Yeah. And, and they can say whatever they want. They can say, nah, we were sweet. Nah, bro. I could see it, bro. I could see it in the trainings. And, um, but fuck, when Mahoney said that, he, yeah, man, he brought back a lot of why we were there, how we were there, because our people fundraised for us to be there. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And I mean a lot. And just to go out that way and have such an extraordinary team, which could have went could have went all the way, I believe. All the way. Samuel and Tonga that, that World Cup was yeah, pretty outstanding. Pretty outstanding. And then straight after the World Cup, like they beat Wales, they yep. beat Scotland, they beat Italy. Straight after easy wins too, like forty point wins against um Italy, I think. Killed Scotland, like, fuck, what a team. And that's when they got rid of, like, five of us. But that team was that good. Who are the five they got rid of? I think it was me, Mahonry, George Stowers. I think Lala went for a bit, but got brought back in. And same with Alessandra, he, he got out for a bit, brought back in. Mm. I was brought back in to start money somewhere three times. I, I got kicked out three times. And the first time they, they brought me into the room, look, please, don't complain about the corruption, please. Yeah, uh, so sat there, my cousin was outside. <laughs> Don't complain about corruption, please. And I was like, yeah, okay. So I complained again, I got kicked out. And then they came up to Apula Heights before the Rugby World Cup. I thought I'd never play again. My mum was there and they sat down. Uh, Fumono was out there. He was like, please don't complain about uh, uh, anything about our union. Or... And so I was like, yeah, sweet. So then I got into the Rugby World Cup. And then, so I didn't complain about the union. I went after World Rugby. So. <laughs> Yeah, fuck, I've been there, bro. I fucking, I've, I've been speaking my shit. That's why, like, some dudes who come out after and say, oh, I lost my career for speaking up about rugby. Bro, where the fuck were you? He was right next to me. Shit. Well, this leads on to... You didn't say <laughs> shit. <laughs> this leads on to a comment from Jimmy Mac 661 on TikTok who says, imagine if the island sides got their fair share of the pot. That'd be absolutely unreal. I urge everyone to watch Daniel... Dan Leo's documentary, Oceans Apart, eye-opening. That guy. Nah, his, his, his uh, documentary's good, but <laughs> he was in my team when I was fucking fighting those battles, bro. Yeah. I was fighting those battles by myself, man. Fucking getting punished. I remember, bro, I remember, to be honest, we had a, after that South Africa game, we had a meetup, and I remember walking in, and it was icy, bro. Because after that game, I fucking went online and said a lot of shit about the referee, someone said, bro, we should kill him. And I, I was like, I was like, it's up to you. <laughs> and I remember like sitting in the, uh, in the case and the judge goes, did you encourage people to kill 
to kill the ref. No, no, I just said, it's up to you. <laughs> yeah, and they were like, you should condemn it. I was like, bro, it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember going into the money sample function and, uh, bro, I went and sat down in the front by myself. I was like, doo 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 True. Yeah, it was icy, man. But, um, yeah, Daniel Leo was in the team then. And this is why when I see, like, Brian Habana yeah. talk shit about, oh, you know, rugby, we should come together and be fair with each other. When they got eight days rest and we got three, they didn't say shit then. You know, there was no player who went, hey, this is a bit unfair, man. You know, we're getting an unfair advantage. You know, these guys have played all these games in one and a half weeks. How about they get a rest? You know, the same rest, so it's an even competition. Well, that dude didn't say shit. None of that team said shit. They just fuck. none of the Wales team said shit. And now they fucking do their woke, oh, rugby is for equality and equity. Fuck up, man. <laughs> Full of shit. Brian Habana, all those dudes, bro, they, they, they benefited from the unfair treatment of Pacific teams. From you guys not having that rest. Yeah, bro, and they wrote it. They didn't say shit. They enjoyed their fishing. They didn't say shit. So for them to come up like they, they are warriors for, for justice, bullshit. Anybody can tackle a man. But these dudes, they can't tackle injustice. If, if um, or what, not if, um, we're about three World Cups now. So we've got the Rugby World Cup, I think, next year in Australia. Or am I right? Or it might be the States. But has much changed? Well, I remember the um, short turnaround said, like, the very next World Cup, it changed. Um, Thank you, Ali. Nah, the refereeing is shit, man. That last World Cup was bullshit. Bro, the Manu Samuel played awesome against England. That should have been a win, man. But, uh, no, um, they've given, like, Samoa Rugby Union a vote in the board, but they've increased the amount of votes for all the other European teams. Right. So... There's no Can power there. Yeah. <laughs> but then you got the chairman of Samoan Rugby Union giving a Matai title to the chairman of the World Rugby in exchange for some money for their village. And you're like, bro. And then Lima Sopawanga going out there and saying, this is shit what World Rugby is doing, having this tournament exclusively for Tier 1. What about Samoa? Yeah. And then you get the chairman of the Samoan Rugby Union voting in favour of the tournament that excludes Samoa. It's like, what the fuck is this shit? Like, bro, like, how disconnected is that? The player going, this tournament's bullshit. And the chairman of his board going, I love this tournament. Yay. Yay for our exclusion. It's like, oh, what the fuck is going on? So if we're not getting shot at, we're shooting ourselves in our own Yeah, yeah harder. Exactly. exactly. And like, fuck, it looks stupid. It looks really stupid. Like, for me, oh gosh, yeah, so, but I try not to center the conversation on Samoa Rugby Union, like, I still think it'll all be solved if we got 10% of Tokyo, 10% of Ireland Test matches, 10% of Scotland, just 10%, and then we want to have all these dramas where the chairman's got to go and give them a title to get some money for the village and all this shit, you know, there'll be money there, and I just think that'll help massively with all this other shit. Like, we wouldn't have to kiss their ass. You know, oh, yay, we, we got two million funding for three years, whereas you could get two million in one test match against England, two million against their, uh, France, two million there in one year. Yeah. You know, so, like, we're begging for fucking peanuts <laughs> that is already owed to us. Yeah. But um, Daniel Leo's documentary, great documentary. I was pissed off that I didn't get a free subscription, so I never watched it. <laughs> if you're gonna fucking use my quotes for your trailer, the very first voice is my fucking voice, because it's a good, strong voice. Gotta give me a free, like, $5 for the subscription, bro, so I never watched it. A hat or something. <laughs> yeah, bro. Um, this is a comment, again, from TikTok. It's from Sis, and this is in response to the scariest man in rugby, uh, which we talked about last week, which was uh, Henry Tuilangi by your calculations, and I think a lot of people agreed, but Sis has said, uh, Trevor Liotta, for me, was the most violent rugby player. Absolute unit. His head alone probably weighed 100 kgs. Uh, Trevor Liotta, if you grew up in the 90s in New Zealand, holy hell, this guy folded men. He folded men in half. Origami, bro. Fuck. This dude was folding laundry, bro, on the rugby field, man. <laughs> but seriously, um, just with the big hits, it's the intelligent thing to do. It's mm. not violent. 
The intelligent thing to do is smoke the opposition with the ball, knock him your hardest, and you might dislodge the ball or you might injure him. But that's intelligent rugby. So just for people who hate hearing like big hits is violent, you know that terminology. It's actually a very intelligent play to smash the guy. But Trevor Leota, yeah, bro. Again, another victim of no YouTube. I, I, someone put up this old clip like of, of them playing him, Brian Lee Ma, in the mud in Apia Park like ages ago. And bro, they are doing like, they're smoking everybody, like big hits. And none of it's on YouTube. Like no one will know how good these old players were. Yeah. And he was massive. Like, and um, he's like your, I guess, your typical short, stout prop. Mm. But I, I do recall when they put him up against the South African team. And it, South Africans are known for big bodies. Mm. And he was smacking them. Yeah. Props. Guys that are twice the size around. Yes. Locks, flankers. Mm. Like nobody's business. Yeah. <laughs> he's like the Hurricanes prop. What's a uh, Hurricanes hooker? The all black dude. Yeah. He, he, oh, um. Amor, is it? Yes, uh, Safo. Yeah. yeah. He, he yeah, reminds yeah. me of. He reminds me a bit of Trevor, but Trevor was like many um, defense. He played a, had a great career in Wasps yep. over there, and um, I think he ran into some money problems recently. So again, that's a good lesson for all of us. Um, he said he was shouting drinks a lot to everybody. But um, as a player on the field, man, he was a, man, just amazing, amazing hitter. That generation, that team, like everyone was a hitter. And I remember we used to have these talks in 2011, like, Bro, bring back the hitting. Where the fuck is it? Like, we used to try and get everyone, like Murray and all of them, bro. Like, they brought it back. That game against Australia hits everywhere, man. And, like, we actually... I feel sorry for Gerard. Oh, bro. I feel sorry for him, the, the Tongan winger for um, Australia. Like, he's a good player, yeah. but, man, he must he must have nightmares of Alessandro oh, Tulangi. Yeah. <laughs> Lala put in some massive hits. Yep. Murray, Mohanri... Bro, like, we were trying to bring it back. I remember, like, we were talking so about... So that was a it. conscious thing? Yeah, bro. I remember talking with uh, with players, like, fuck, man, let's bring it back. Like, you watch the old clips. Apollo Perilini was another one, bro. You saw fold people. That whole team was naturally big hitters. And that's the way that someone used to play. Naturally, used to just smash people. That that That's an um, interesting kind of point because, uh, like, I think we talked about it with the Sevens as well, like... Some more of that, the physicality was one of our biggest strengths. Um, and then the rules have kind of changed a lot where it's it's almost any any kind of indiscretion around necks and head, like it's kind of touch and go, but it feels like it's taken away a lot of yeah. our best element, yeah, bro. which was that physical strength that we've yeah. got. Hard out. And you just wonder if it's deliberate, eh? But yeah, for Is sure. It? Yeah, hard out. <laughs> I mean, you look at some of the decisions, man. Remember Alessandro got like three weeks for running over someone, like bowling him over, and he got uh, penalized because he said it's his knees, his knees fault that the guy's head got hit. What the fuck? The dude was just running and the guy can't tackle. Bro, so, yeah, man, it's like all these rules coming in. I understand the player safety, and it is a lot harder now to do big hits. Yeah, you know, back then, back then there was rucking too. So the whole, um, the whole, the whole game was centered around. I've been ranger. I've been rucked. I can, I can, oh, I can take man. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no one complained. Like that was the rule. Like, yeah. if you're not gonna let the ball go, they were allowed to stand on your face and stand on your body. And that was the game. So the hits naturally, yeah, shit followed that. But yeah, I'd say it definitely is a bit harder now. You know, Cause, and you don't know which way the call's going to go now, man. Like, sometimes you run too low, you, you might be penalised. That must be frustrating for a player. Mm. Like, yeah. how do you tackle someone if you're using the proper technique mm. and then half of the time you're getting pinged on it? I don't know. And some of them are dipping. They're going low, but then the runner goes low. And then it's an accidental head clash. The fuck, man? It's like... Penalty somewhat. Yeah, and bro, it's definitely ruining the game. And like we saw in the Pacific... Uh, Strategy report, man. Participation is decreasing. Yeah. It's you wonder why? Yeah, bro. It's <laughs> and um, our last comment of the day for the pod is uh, from Uso Connections. This is uh, this is off the back of the Khan Futuali video, which is um, a lot of people obviously remember. Remember how great he was. 
Um, but he likened it to, uh, it's like Tamalolo choosing Tonga. At the height of their performance, they chose the islands. Yeah. And it's like those leagueies, bro. You know, Crichton, To'o. Why? Yeah. You know, those guys at the height of their career. But in rugby, it's a bit, it's a bit it means a bit more because you can't swap back. You know, mm. Once you pick Manu Samo, there's no going back. Whereas in league, you can go back to Australia, like some other players have done. Ah, the uh, Titans. Yeah. Uh, um, he he went back, and you know when you're getting thirty-five thousand for a game or something, thirty thousand for a game as opposed to one thousand. But in rugby, man, you make that one choice, and um, it affects everything. So because now you're not allowed to. Well, you are allowed to play in New Zealand, but it's very hard to stay in New Zealand when the the number nine underneath you makes himself available for New Zealand, then Crusaders will favour that person. Yeah. Which is why anyone who makes himself available for Manu Samoa, it's inevitable that they go overseas because that's the only pathway there is. And so for him to choose Manu Samoa is also choosing to take your family out of New Zealand. Yeah. So it's a big move. It's a big move. And choosing less money. So. And just um, in response to last week's pod, uh, it was... Alapati Leua yes. from Wellington, who yes. was freaking dynamic. He's another one. He's another one, I believe, was ready to be an All Black, in line to be an All Black. It was and actually uh, Corey, uh, Corey from, he hit me up on my DMs and he said it was Alapati and Steve Hansen wanted him yeah. 2012. Yes. Yeah. And he chose Manu Samoa. And again, when overseas, you, you, that's where it leads you. So. And these guys, the thing is, like, you might play New Zealand one test and people will go, Oh, is it just a one test All Black? He should have played for Manu Samoa. But being an All Black, it ups your value, even for that one test. So when you go overseas, you're more valuable than a Manu Samoa mm -hmm. player. Okay, so you're worth about 50,000 to 100,000 pounds more just because you're an All Black. So even like we, we always see a pro, you, you messed up your, your one test match for Manu Samoa, you're still a lot more. You're still making money. You still make shitloads just being that one All Black, that one test. Once you get that all black tag, it's still very beneficial for you overseas. Mm. So yeah, it might cost you Manu Samoa, but you still gain something with that. So even to turn down the one test match for the all blacks, it's still a big call. It's not like, wow, at least he got two World Cups, three World Cups. Yeah, but you lose a lot of money with it. Yeah. Well, that's us for another episode of the Offside Podcast. Um, yeah, pretty interesting topics today. and. I love you, Daniel Leo. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> the camera's there. Was... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good documentary. You guys should check it out. <laughs> Tell me if it's good. Give him a hat. <laughs> Daniel, give him a hat. <laughs>